Hi, my name's Gabe, and I have a problem. I have way too many of these small satellite dishes. I keep collecting these things whenever I find them on Craigslist, or Facebook Marketplace, or local surplus, or auctions, estate sales, it's the side of the road, basically anywhere I see an RV, ice fishing, tailgating, camping style satellite dish, I pick it up, at least if they're cheap. Now, if you've seen my prior videos, I've done some really interesting things with these. I've turned the little tailgater units on the top there into microwave imagers, so I can take a microwave picture of geostationary orbit, of buildings, of all kinds of stuff, and basically see the world in the 12 gigahertz KU band spectrum. I've played around a little bit with that with some of these other dishes, but we've focused more on the tailgaters in the past than on their main competitor, uh, the WineGuard dish. Now, WineGuard makes these carryout models. In this video, I just wanted to go over a couple of the different models of WineGuard antenna that I come across, see if we can hack into them, see if we can make them do other things that they were never intended to do. Originally, these are just for satellite TV. They are just to take out camping, take out uh, to your cabin, take out to your ice fishing shack. They automatically find the TV satellite and boom, you're watching NFL or whatever people watch these days. I'm not big into TV. Ironically enough, I almost never watch TV. I almost never watch satellite TV, but I have a ton of satellite TV antennas. So I like to find alternate uses for the things. First off, let's look at the original WineGuard carryout, the Generation 1 G1, although it's not branded that way, but this was their first entry, as far as I know, into the portable satellite dish market. As you can tell, these are designed for all of your outdoor activities where you want to avoid the great outdoors and watch football instead. So you can put your big TV in your car, bring the satellite dish along with you, out to uh, family picnics where you don't want to interact with your family, RVing, out in the wilderness where you don't want to interact with the wilderness. Uh, if you're a trucker, you can bring this out to the truck stop. They don't really suggest actually mounting this version on top of your vehicle. It's supposed to be pulled out and set on the little tripod unit. And then, of course, your lake cabin. And, you know, anywhere else that you happen to be away from your house and you absolutely can't live without satellite television. These are made in Burlington, Iowa. And they came in a couple different options. You could get the original white or you could get the nice camo one here. So if your uh, family doesn't want you watching TV while you're out camping, you can sneak away from the campsite set up the camouflage antenna and nobody will know what you're doing. So this one is in the box, but it's definitely used and it smells like the inside of a cigarette carton in here. So uh, that's always the risk of getting a used one. If it's been in a smoker's house, it kind of smells like a smoker's lungs. This uh, is powered by 12 volt DC. So we've got the car adapter and we've got their proprietary plug. I, on my old one, I just cut this off and used something else because this was a kind of a hard plug to find. Normally I just get these as the bare dome unit and they don't come with paperwork, so it's kind of fun to see uh, all the settings. You've got dip switches where you can switch it from DirecTV, Dish, Bell. Kind of shows you the coverage area for each system. And our main antenna is in here and these styrofoam cradles are always kind of difficult to get out of the box. I'm probably have to set this on the floor to extract it. The dish is inside here. This is just a protective radome to keep uh, water and wind off of it. This one also came with the little tripod mount. So the dish clips onto this uh, circular platform. You've got these feet that pop out and then they can extend out to different lengths to level things. Let's move on to the fun part. We've got the protective radome removed. So we've taken that cover off of the dish and you can see how it's all set up in here. And this is actually a two stage reflector. So the radio signal is coming in, bouncing off the dish here, bouncing off this little metal puck and then being directed down into the guts of the dish. That radio signal comes in here, goes into this LNB or low noise block device, and this down converts 12 gigahertz microwave signals to something that your set top box can receive. This white box is the brain, so this controls the motors that point the dish, and I think it has a little receiver in here that actually reads the signal strength from the dish and tells the equipment when it's actually pointed at the correct satellite. We also have my little satellite hacking cyber deck that I built, and this is a Raspberry Pi inside a custom case with some fairly custom hardware. It's really overkill for something like this. You could do all the same stuff with a laptop, but I think this looks cooler. It's a little more rugged, and it's a little more customized for all the ports and things that I want. Now, when I say hacking, I'm not actually hacking any satellites or doing anything illegal up in space. We're just looking at the ground-based hardware. We're tapping into the brain on the antenna dish here 
and getting it to do stuff it's not really supposed to, or me as the consumer isn't really intended to. Again, it's not illegal, it's just not recommended by the manufacturer. So you'll definitely void your warranty doing any of this, and that's another reason why I do this with cheap dishes that I find on Craigslist. And I should also say I am not hacking anything to get free television. I don't care about TV, I don't watch it enough to bother hacking satellite TV. So if you clicked on this video hoping to get free pay-per-view or free sports or whatever, that's not this kind of video, sorry. A lot of the satellite antennas I've messed with have had slightly different interfaces for a remote control or programming system. Some are USB, this guy happens to be a little phone jack, and it's not actually a modem, it's not actually Ethernet, it's not even serial, it is RS-485, which is kind of the industrial version of RS-232, we're going to need some custom stuff to get into that. And fortunately, a while back, one of my viewers suggested exactly how to get into this using a RS-232 serial to RS-45 adapter and then serial to USB so we can talk to this weird, obscure industrial communications protocol using just a normal, everyday computer. And I'm sure someone out there who works for Honeywell or Bosch will take issue with me calling RS-45 obscure, but you know what? If it doesn't show up in your daily life, if you don't have it lying around your house, it's pretty obscure. Maybe a bunch of industry uses it, but I like protocols and communication systems for normal people that anyone can use. So this is the RS-232 to RS-485 adapter. So it's basically just a regular serial port on one end, and then it's got this breakout for the RS-485. That goes to our modified phone cord. Now this is not the old style four pin phone cord that your grandma might still have on her landline at home. This is six pin, so you will need to find kind of a special phone cable if you're doing this yourself. I had one in my junk drawer and I think you can find them online pretty easily. I'll throw the link in the description to this wiring pin out for which wires go from the adapter to the phone port. So that goes into our uh, debug terminal here on the back of the dish brain. And then we need a 9-pin serial to USB adapter. These are pretty cheap online. There are a lot of weird knockoffs and a lot of weird drivers floating around, so if you're using Windows, uh, you might have to tell it to ignore the latest driver and use an old one. I'm using Linux, so I can kind of do whatever I want and I don't have to deal with Windows nonsense. The other thing to keep in mind with this is if you hook this up to your computer and then give the dish power, these WineGuard dishes, at least the Gen 1s, have a little dance they want to go through to find the satellite. So this thing will want to start moving its motors, spinning around, Searching for a satellite. We're here in my garage. I don't have any satellites in my garage aside from the fake one that I have uh, hanging from the ceiling. So it's not going to find anything in here, but it's certainly going to try for about 10 minutes. And you don't actually want your computer hooked up yet because as it spins around, it will tangle your cables. Since we have the right power cable, I'm going to use that with this one. Um, although it just stinks. It has been inside of a smoker's lungs. It, it's not great. So we'll give this power and let it finish its little initial dance. As I've mentioned before, these have kind of a terrible limit finding method. WineGuard did not bother to install any position sensors or limit switches in this thing, uh, at least not in this model. So it basically just spins around until it hits the limit of how far the gears will go, grinds the gears, and then it knows that's where it can finish up. So I think that might be a planned obsolescence thing. Maybe WineGuard knows that after 100 or 200 startup sequences like this, those plastic gears will be destroyed and you'll have to throw this in the trash, go back to wine garden, buy another one. And like I said, this takes about 10 minutes, so we'll be sitting here for a while. I'll cut to something else. The antenna has given up, so now we can connect it to the computer. So I need to figure out which port this is on, and yes, I do have another serial port over here, which is actually another USB to serial adapter under the hood, but this one is closer, and I just had a little short cable today. And this works better if I'm root in Linux. I know that's not best practice, but I have issues if I try to do it as a regular user. So we'll do LSUSB to find out what USB devices we have plugged in. So we've got Future Technology USB and Prolific Technology USB. Those are two of kind of the standard common ones you find on Amazon. I believe this one is the Prolific. I'm going to run Screen Command, which will give me a new terminal window connected to a serial device. In this case, we're doing screen TTY USB 1. I'm setting the baud rate 57600 because that's something that's worked well with these devices before. 
and we're getting kind of a garbled return, so that indicates maybe that baud rate is not correct. There could be a lot of hoops to jump through with stuff like this because I don't exactly know how the dish is trying to respond. It doesn't exactly know what I'm trying to do, and a lot of these dishes have slightly different software installed on them. This one seems to have a HAL version 1.00.07, which I think is a little bit different from the last one I've tried. That had HAL 1.0. Hopefully everyone out there has watched 2001 and knows that if you let HAL run a dish antenna, you're going to have issues. I'm sorry, Dave. I'm afraid I can't do that. I don't know if the developers put this in as a joke or if the software is actually named HAL, but either way, it's kind of funny. When in doubt for USB stuff like this, unplug it and plug it back in. These are cheap Chinese cables with knockoff drivers and they don't work every time. All right, we are back in the dish console. And now we have a legible return from the dish brain. I kind of regret making the screen so small in the cyber deck. I can't actually read everything without scrolling back up. But these are some of the options that the dish is giving us over that serial connection. I don't actually know what half of this stuff does. For me, the main things I like to do with a dish like this is directly drive the motors, aim the thing around, and then I can look at satellites that are not television. I can look at weather satellites, I can do radio astronomy, or with the tailgater, and some of these other dishes, I can do microwave imaging. So for example, let's go into the target submenu, and this gives us a bunch of target process debuggers. Again, this is a slightly different firmware version than some of the other WineGuard carryout dishes I've used, so I think it has some slightly different options than the last one I played with. Since I don't know where it's aiming now, and I don't want to tangle my cables, I'm going to try that relative angle command. So I'm going to tell it to run 10 degrees positive azimuth and negative 20 degrees elevation relative to where it is now. Yeah, that worked great. Another nice thing about these wine guards is they are very fast. The tailgater dishes are a lot slower. They're easier to interface with because they're USB, but they run incredibly slow. Let's send it 20 degrees the other way in azimuth and back up in elevation. This is why I love messing with these little satellite dishes and why I keep hoarding the things. It is just so satisfying to tell it to go to an angle and just watch it whip around and aim right where you tell it. This is useful for all kinds of stuff beyond satellite TV. We could do ham radio stuff with this. We could do drone tracking. We could do other uh, radio experiments. You could even put a small telescope on this, although the weight capacity is a little bit limited, so you want to be careful with that. For this video, I want to move on to some other WineGuard products and see how do those compare to this G1 that I'm already somewhat familiar with? Next up, we have the WineGuard Carryout G2 Plus. Gen 2, this is a little bit updated version of that last one. It's a little bit smaller, thinner, it's about the same height. And we can pop the top on this. I've already taken the screws out. And you can see it's all very similar inside. We have the same type of two-stage dish reflector here. We have the LNB in the back, we have a brain board and we've got these stepper motors that drive the azimuth and elevation. Now a couple other differences with this guy. We do have a USB port. We have a USB-A port. I've messed with that before in another video and I was not able to do much with that. I think that is to plug in a flash drive and you can update the firmware on this thing. I tried that too and I didn't have any luck with it, so for my purposes we're going to ignore the USB port. You'll also note there is no power input here. There are just coax cable inputs. A lot of dishes use power from the set-top box or from an external power injector, and they just inject DC voltage into the antenna cable. So that's what this one uses. So we're going to need to put the uh, 12 volts into the uh, cable here somehow. Basically, different voltages tell the LNB to look at different polarities, different directions that the signals are coming down. We don't need to know any of that right now. That's not really important for the scope of this video. We have the same a phone jack in the side of the brain box here, so I think we can probably talk to this with the same setup. I've not actually tried this before, so this is the first time I'm trying to interface directly with this particular antenna using the RS-45 situation. I just walked back into the garage and it smells like an ashtray in here, so um, that WineGuard G1 that came from a smoker's house might have to go. Alright, back to our G2 dish. I have somehow misplaced the good power supply that I normally use with my little power injectors here. I've been tearing the house apart, I've been tearing the garage apart, can't find that power supply. I took it out to open sauce to run the tailgater and I know I brought it home, but I don't know where it went after that. So 
Fortunately, I got this little variable DC power supply from Axeman, so I think we can hack this into the coax cable, and then we can feed that dish 14 to 16 volts, and hopefully that's enough for the motors to be happy. All right, we gave this thing power. It does not seem to have an auto calibration mode, or it's not getting enough power to run the motors, but it just sat there. It's not trying to spin around and find the satellite right away. That's kind of nice. It means we can plug into the computer right away and see if we can talk to it. I am getting something on the serial console, but it's nothing recognizable. It's just a couple symbols and characters. So again, might be the wrong baud rate, or again, we might have to unplug our USB and plug it back in. All right, let's try the next baud rate up. Since this is a slightly newer dish, we'll go slightly faster. And okay. We have a track prompt, TRK. That is the same thing the other one gave us, so that's a good sign. Let's see if we can get a help menu the same way we did with the G1. Yeah, I think we're not getting the full response from the thing because it's it's truncating here. So, now oh, there we go. We got a little bit more of a menu this time. Um, so it looks like we've got motor driver, ADC, dip switch, DVB. Uh, we can do some EEPROM and GPIO stuff. Yeah, similar to, but still fewer options than the Gen 1 unit. Let's see what the firmware is on this one. Okay, it looks like we're uh, NVS 1.02.13, and then uh, system ID is 12 inch. I guess that means a 12 inch dish. See, I think we hit Q to go back up a level, or maybe that just terminates the shell. Yeah, we're, we're getting some truncated responses again here, so we do not have a consistent connection right now. I did get into the motor submenu, and we have quite a few more options in here. So we can do stuff like list the motors. So we've got azimuth and elevation, as expected. Um, some dishes might have a skew motor to rotate uh, the L and B, and that way you get different polarities. But a little dish like this would set the polarity based on the voltage. Um, we've got stall detect and motor life information. I have not heard this one try to auto search, so I don't know if it detects uh, run limits with by stalling or by grinding gears the way the other one did. So we do have some interesting commands here. We've got uh, motor positioning stuff, we've got scanning. We've got one that I am very interested in called sky map. Now I was basically using these to do a sky map in uh, microwave frequencies and if that's anything like what this built-in command is that would be really cool. If this would actually give me um, some kind of bitmap or sky map of signal strengths, that would be really neat. But I'm not quite sure what that command does. Let's see if we can find out uh, help about it. So this looks almost identical to the program that I wrote for the dish tailgater to scan an azimuth and elevation range and output a map of signal strengths. I, this is looking really promising. If this is already on the firmware, this makes this dish 100% more useful and more interesting. What I don't know is how you get that bitmap or array or table or whatever format it saves that data in. I don't know how you get it out of the system here. I don't know if it's going to give me something in ASCII or try to send me a file, but I'm willing to screw around with this because I'm very interested in this command. It looks like the manual aiming commands are a little bit different than the last dish. Instead of giving it a pair of azimuth elevation to go to, you have to select which motor and then what angle to drive that motor to. So I think if we do something like A, zero for azimuth, plus 20 for positive 20 azimuth degrees, um, this might tangle my cable, but let's give it a shot. All right, looks like that worked. Let's tell it to go to elevation 45. Perfect, just as fast as the last one. These are really quick motors. Again, this is the first time I've used this particular dish successfully and gotten it to take serial commands. So I'm just screwing around with it. I'm not doing anything really useful right now, although I'm very interested in that SkyScan program. If we wanted to actually control this directly from the computer to track a drone, track satellites, do something else, we'd have to write some Python code or some other code to interface with the serial port, send it the type of commands that it's expecting to go to certain uh, elevation and azimuth ranges, run each particular motor to a specific degree. We could definitely do that. We're not gonna do that in this video. I'm just learning how it works for now. I'm gonna try this sky map thing with how I think the parameters go. Not 100% sure though, so hopefully I don't wreck anything. So it's giving us the raw data of the um, signal strength and whatnot, but it's not moving the way I expected it to. So I was thinking it would pan back and forth. It's just kind of going around in a circle and um, 
yeah, incrementing up one thing at a time. So this is a really cool command, but I don't know how it works yet. It definitely runs much faster than my own Python code does. Um, I think it's done. I still don't know how you get the data out, but it has given us some really cool data. I guess if we were doing this with a Python script, we could just read this stuff off the serial terminal and then use it to populate an array. I want to sit here and poke at this sky map command like all night now, but that wasn't in the scope of this video. I wanted to just look at these dishes, see what they could do, see what some of the commands are, and we've definitely found a very interesting one. So I'm gonna probably have to come back to the G2 dish here at some point in the future. I don't fully understand how SkyMap works. I don't fully understand how to interface with it. There's no information on the internet about this. I have searched for it. I've looked around for that command and there's no data. We're not supposed to know about this command. This is a secret developer only or technician only menu. This is a secret technician only command that is incredibly cool if it does what I think it does, but I need to learn more about it. So we'll try to come back to that at some point. If anybody out there has an idea on this, or if you are a developer of the WineGuard dish or of this firmware and you want to throw me some hints, uh, please do. You can email me, gabe at saveitforparts.com or shoot me a message through YouTube. But um, yeah, very interested in learning more about that. All right, our next one here comes in its very own backpack. So you can take your satellite dish out backpacking, adventuring, just all over the place. Imagine the look on your friends' faces when you show up to that four-month trip of the Appalachian Trail. They've brought backpacks full of boring stuff like food and camping gear and bug repellent, but you have showed up with the Backpack WineGuard satellite dish so you can watch TV every night of your journey along the Appalachian Trail. Truly, the modern era is amazing. Now, I know this one says King on the outside. I don't know if that's the original uh, backpack that came with this. Uh, King Controls, I think, either bought out or became WineGuard or Tailgater or... A lot of these satellite dish companies are kind of interrelated somehow in various confusing corporate shenanigans. Anyway, what we have inside the backpack is the G3. So we've moved up to the third generation WineGuard carryout. Digging around in the bottom of that case, we have some other interesting stuff. We've got a couple little uh, coax jumper cables. We do have the manual, and we have another power injector. And this one has some dip switches right on it. So I think this is how you set the dish for DirecTV, uh, Bell, whatever. I'm kind of wondering if this is what tells the dish to go through that initial search mode. You remember on the G1, it takes 10 minutes to sit there and look for the satellite. The G2 just turned on and didn't look for anything. It might be because we weren't giving the G2 a signal from this little box to tell it where to look. This one uses some stupid star bits, so maybe at this point in their development they'd realize that people want to open these up and see what's in there, and they wanted to make it harder. They don't, developers don't want you to see what's in their product. That, that's a big no-no. I think these look way cooler with the top off. It would be cooler if these had a transparent shell and you could see that dish moving around. I think some newer models do that. They finally realize that people want to see how cool the dish is, but these older ones, they just want an anonymous black dome. Fortunately, I have some star bits so we can get this open. Pretty similar to the other ones. Kind of a weird dish shape. It's not a perfect circle. It's got kind of this cutout on top, and I guess that's to fit within the truncated ray dome. Very smooth motion on the motors on this one. I suspect this goes a lot faster than even the other two. Now, as usual, we have our brain board. However, I am not seeing that phone jack on here. So what we do have is a receiver set up and we've got these little connectors. We've got what almost looks like a Wi-Fi uh, trace antenna in here. So it's possible you can control this from your phone or from an app or something. We do have some interesting debug and JTAG interfaces. So if I knew how to use any of that stuff, we could solder on some debug headers. We could mess with it on kind of a lower level of hardware hackery that I don't understand, unfortunately. So I'll have to leave that for somebody else to play around with. We have a provision for a SKU motor here, but it is not hooked up. We've got a little boot switch, so I think that is for uh, flashing new firmware. We do have a USB port, which might also be just for flashing firmware. If we're lucky, we might be able to talk to the thing over that USB port, but I'm not sure what else is really in here. I think this is an ARM processor. There's a Broadcom chip. This is going to be for the signal processing. We do have another little reset button down here in addition to that boot button. First up, we'll give it power the way the manufacturer intended through this external box. And we've got a few indicators on the box. We've got voltage in, receiver, antenna, 
and power. And we do have a little power switch, so we'll hit that. Oh! Oh, I hate that sound! Weingard has obviously learned nothing about crashing their gearing into the limits because it just... oh. It sounds like it's tearing itself apart. Maybe it's not. Maybe this is perfectly fine and stepper motors can handle that, but this is a terrible way to build consumer trust in your product. If your product sounds like that, I'm not gonna buy it. I, no way, that thing sounds terrible. It sounds like there was no thought put into the design. It sounds like there was no care put into the manufacturing, and it sounds like it is grinding itself apart. Anyway, it is doing the little dance, looking for the satellite, and I think that's because we have it powered through this external box with the dip switches. I'm actually gonna unhook this box because I don't want it to sit here dancing all day. I wanna get into hacking it. So I've got my power supply set to about 18 volts. So the motherboard is powered. We've got lights on there, but we've got no startup dance. So again, that little box is what tells it to do the initial search. And this time, since we don't have a phone port, I'm gonna use a USB a to A cable to go to the little port on here over to the computer. On the tailgater dishes, this is what gives us a serial console, but I don't know if it's going to do it on here. So on the cyber deck, we're getting a no file or directory error when I try to screen into USB 1. All right, we got that same error for every USB device that I could try. So it seems like just like the G2, the G3 does not have a serial terminal directly available on that USB port. So I'm not sure how you get into this as a technician to mess around with any of those fancy signal settings. Maybe you don't. Maybe everything is just programmed at the factory and they have expect it to be thrown away instead of fixed. A lot of companies do that. They don't actually intend to repair or service anything. If they get it back for an RMA, it just goes in a landfill and the customer gets a new one. Otherwise, it's possible some of these solder pads are for an RS-45 connection. They just aren't populated on here. So on the practical side, that kind of means that our G3 wine guard is not very useful, at least not to someone like me. I want to hack into it, I want to tell it where to point from the computer, and I don't have a way to do that. What I could do is rip the brain out of this, put a Raspberry Pi in there, have that run the stepper motors, and have that aim the antenna around. I've threatened to do that with a few of my antennas in the past. I haven't quite yet done that because I keep finding ways to hack into them externally, but yeah, we'll keep the hardware around here. I do like how quickly the steppers move. I like how smooth and fluid this one is. They've definitely improved the design of the motors, of the gearing. They still haven't improved the, the homing mechanism or the limit mechanism because it still sounds terribly destructive. Yeah, I can't think of much else to do with the G3 at the moment, so I think we're gonna package it back up, throw it on a shelf, and continue hoarding it until I think of some use for it. That's about all I've got for these dishes. We've checked out all three generations of WineGuard satellite antenna that I have. I think they might be up to a G4 or G5 by now, but I haven't come across one of those in the $50 range yet. If you've got one and you want to trade me for something, let me know in the comments. In conclusion, we've found the G1 is pretty reliable, uh, pretty easy to interface with. You don't really have to do any fancy hacking. You just have to have that special RS-45 dongle. Or maybe it's RS-422. You know what? I can't remember, and it doesn't matter. You don't really need to know anything about RS-45 or RS-422 or even RS-232. Just connect it up to a USB adapter, connect it up to that phone cord adapter, and pull up a screen terminal on Linux and start screwing around with it. Um, I haven't yet found a way to completely destroy one of these. I'm sure there are commands I could send that would really get me into trouble with the hardware here. I could probably wreck something, but... I've just been doing a lot of trial and error with these with a little bit of help from some viewers. And again, thank you very much to the viewers who suggested things like the RS-45 adapter and suggested some of the commands and the baud rates. That's very helpful. The G2 is also fairly easy to interface with with that same cable and offers some really interesting options, which I'm going to try to circle back around to. I really want to play around with some of the stuff that's in the firmware for the G2. I don't understand it yet, so... I can't include it in this video. We will try to come back to that. The G3 I'm a little disappointed in. It's a little too new. It doesn't have those uh, system level interfaces, doesn't have those technician interfaces. So it's only really useful to me as just spare parts and hardware. And maybe we'll get around to that in the future. Maybe we'll put a Raspberry Pi in there. In the meantime, I hope everyone enjoyed this quick look at WineGuard satellite dish hacking. If you have any questions, throw them in the comments down below. If you have any suggestions for what else I can do with some of these, Check out some of my other videos for stuff along these lines, messing with wine guard dishes, with dish tailgaters, with other satellite equipment, and uh, building the little cyber deck here. 
all kinds of things like that, among many other projects and videos that I have on this channel. If you want to support more videos like this, I do have a Patreon and a YouTube membership thing. Those are always super helpful for funding my weird videos. Finally, thank you to everyone for watching, and we'll see you next time. All right, well, there's a thumbnail image if I ever saw one.